Hello, I'm Haslinda Amin of Bloomberg Television. It's never been more important for the financial industry, from big banks to fintechs and startups, to drive positive climate change to get us to net zero by 2050. And so far, many financial leaders have made a commitment to the goal. Companies that manage $88 trillion, or about a third of global financial assets, all pledging to pivot to decarbonize their portfolios. The question is, how do we make the leap from commitment to real action that can make a difference to the climate crisis and avoid a catastrophe. Let's get insights, perspectives from Mark Carney, longtime advocate for sustainability. Mark is UN Special Envoy on Climate Change and Finance and former governor of the Bank of England. Mark, hello. Hello, Haslund. It's wonderful to see you again. <laughs> And you, Let, let's start with momentum. There seems to be momentum. It appears monumental. Enough for you to say that we will get to $100 trillion and counting in terms of assets committing to net zero. Is the global financial system at a tipping point on tackling climate change? I think we are. Um, obviously, finance doesn't operate in isolation, so it matters what governments are doing, and ultimately, finance uh, exists to serve companies and individuals, so uh, the consequences of their actions as well. But uh, the numbers you just uh, indicated, which are part of this Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, they're real, um, and those commitments are not um, you know, just they are commitments for 2050 net zero, but they're short term commitments as well. Five year decarbonizations for the banks. Uh, the, those plans will come out in the course of the next 18 months um, and then action leading on from that and through, from our asset managers and asset owners as well. So it is at a tipping point. And I'll, I'll make one other point and we can go into detail if you wish. Um, but we've also we're changing the plumbing of the financial system in in parallel with these commitments being made so that institutions have the information, they have the tools, and they have some new markets in order to actually move towards net zero. Uh, we talk about having the tools. That's definitely not, the issue is not about capital. I mean, it is a trillion dollar opportunity for the financial industry. Uh, how do we mobilize the capital to build this net zero economy? What do the banks, what do the financial institutions have to do? How does a robust climate action plan look like? Well, there's a couple of things. One thing we need to provide, um, and part of it will come from robust climate action plans. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But we need to provide basic information to financial institutions. Um, so one of the big pushes, as you know, over the course of the last five years has been to get that information through uh, climate disclosure, something called the TCFD, which, to be honest, six years ago, I and Mike Bloomberg launched it as a concept at the Paris, uh, Paris meeting uh, for the Paris Accord. Uh, we only had the first draft of the standards three years ago, but now in the course of the last few months, we've had the G7 and the G20 support mandatory disclosure of this fundamental information so markets can work. Um, and we will have that mapped into rules um, either in the jurisdiction like in Europe or through a new, a whole new body of the International uh, Sustainability Standards Board, the IASB, which as you know, I mean, across Asia, where I am in Canada, 120 other countries, they provide the, the rules for disclosure. So that's fundamental. But your, your core question is well, what do companies do? What is a decarbonization plan? What's what's best practice for that? And I think that there's a couple of elements uh, to it. One, you need um, medium term targets. So in other words, a five year horizon for those plans. You need to disclose scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions where material. So up and down the supply chain, that information needs to be gathered. Uh, in addition, you should uh, have annual reporting, obviously, so we can track how you're doing. Um, but as with anything that's strategic for a company, and this is fundamentally strategic, uh, it makes sense to have robust board oversight and to tie management compensation to, uh, to, to the outcomes of the progress on those paths. Now, what, I'll say one last thing, Haslan, that, that group, that Glasgow Financial Alliance uh, for Net Zero, the 88 trillion, uh, those are real institutions. They're ones who are allocating capital. So one of the things we're doing as a group is we're getting together and defining what those best practices are. I gave you the headlines. Uh, we're going down a bit more granular so companies know what's expected of them and financial institutions only get the information that they're going to use in order to make these decisions.
The thing is, Mark, why isn't this happening fast enough? I mean, we talk about how uh, we're facing a catastrophe. Yeah. The UN came out to say that it is code red for humanity. I mean, how do we expedite the whole process? It's fine and good talking about, you know, needing to get there and these are the tools, but yeah. why is it not quite where we need to be? Well, we've certainly left it very late, um, and those warnings are real and they're they're accurate. Um, what I will say, and 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 you know, if you and I were talking a few years ago, we'd be speaking of the tragedy of the horizon and that we are leaving it too late. And by the time it gets so serious, it's so obvious from physical climate events, uh, we can't do uh, what we need to do in order to prevent it. Um, but we have there's been a huge shift uh, in the course of the last eighteen months. I'll just give you a couple of figures. Um, that 88 trillion number was 5 trillion 18 months ago. So massive move. Um, but for countries, uh, less than one third of global emissions were covered by net zero objectives of countries themselves. Now it's three quarters in counting. So we've had a big shift in countries making those commitments. That's starting to drop down to policy. So it's really hitting the economics of things. And so I'll give you a, you know, a classic example here is you won't be able to sell an internal combustion engine vehicle in the UK or Europe uh, after 2030. I mean, that is a huge shift that's only happened in the last 12 months. That drives big investment, that drives finance. So we're, we're all candidly scrambling to uh, catch up. Um, I think the good news is that the core of the financial system is ready. Um, we want to expand that core, obviously, and we want to make sure we get all the necessary rules and information in place fast. Last point, if I may, I talked about disclosure. It was a concept six years ago. We got the you know, uh, first cut three years ago. Uh, that IASB board that I referenced is being set up formally at Glasgow. They are going to release their first standards the middle of next year. That's, you know, you, that is unheard of for a financial regulator, particularly a new one. The reason they're doing it is they can build on the work that's already been done by the private financial sector and because the issue is urgent. So would that mean that, because at the core issue, the core issue of sustainability is a def definition of sustainability itself. I mean, asset managers are cherry picking yeah. the definition uh, to their advantage. I mean, will that be fixed? Well, I think so. That is a big question and it's a fundamental uh, question. And so I'm going to distinguish between broader ESG or that form of sustainability, broader ESG and the transition to net zero, which is fundamentally, as you know, and everyone knows, is fundamentally necessary to address climate change. The good news, if you will, about uh, the transition to net zero, it, these are hard numbers. They can be measured. You can see progress. What are your emissions? What are you financing today? What do you expect to finance tomorrow? And give us annual progress reports on that. Um, that is different. Uh, or that is easier to measure. In fact, you know, we in finance like bottom lines. We like hard numbers. We can measure who's doing well and who isn't. Uh, we can take judgments. That is that that is a huge advantage in this case. Now it's you know with respect to biodiversity broader measures of sustainability, the impact of uh, transition on local communities, on, uh, on you know, inequality, uh, uh, broader aspects, as I'm saying, of ESG, that is much harder to measure uh, and much more subject to uh, differences of opinion and in some cases, um, uh, misrepresentation. With net zero, the system is gonna be very clear, very robust. Uh, you're either on the path or you're not, um, and you will be rewarded or punished accordingly. You touched on governments earlier. There is greater momentum among governments. I mean, China says peak CO2 emissions by 2030. And, you know, more significantly, President Xi Jinping did say that China will stop funding uh, new coal fired power projects abroad. Is that really a game changer? I think these are these are very significant announcements um, uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One, they were entirely domestically generated. Um, so when uh, President Xi made his announcement a year ago uh, of the peak in 2030 and net zero by at, at the latest, in, in his words, at the latest 2060, um, candidly, people didn't know it was coming. Um, 
uh, outside of uh, China. So it wasn't, it, it was part of, it was domestically motivated. I mean, the Chinese care about the environment. They also care about the competitiveness of their economy um, uh, in, in the new green economy. In fact, I was in a meeting uh, uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago uh, where it was pointed out that great powers will be green powers um, in the future, which is, I, I totally subscribe to that. So the first thing is it's domestically motivated and the motivations are there. The second, in my experience uh, with climate uh, and anything related candidly to engineering, um, when China says it's going to do something, it, it has mapped out how it's going to do it and intends to uh, execute it. Um, and so the coal announcement, the nearer term announcement, which came just in the last few weeks, uh, of stopping for funding uh, uh, foreign coal uh, plants that builds on the announcement of April uh, to uh, basically peak coal in 2025. Again, I, I think those are significant. Would we like more? Yes. Uh, we'd like the 2060 to move in um, uh, the net zero timeline. We'd like uh, you know more clarity in terms of um, uh, the, the amount of coal that will be built um, and then retired in China. Uh, we want more from everybody, uh, candidly, as well. So I'm not singling out China, um, but I would underscore the importance of uh, what they have already done. What more would you like? Because in my conversations, I keep hearing that governments, regulators need to do more. I mean, how encouraged yeah. have you been by what you're hearing, by what you're seeing from governments around the world? Well, I, you know, let, let me give you some numbers to put it in context, uh, and I'll, I'll use the IEA, the International Energy Agency, a few months ago. They did their analysis, and they said, look, if, if governments all accomplish their timelines for emissions reductions by 2030 and then uh, net zero by 2050 or 2060, the world will end up with a uh, temperature warming of 2.1 degrees. So that already tells us that we need more rapid reduction of emissions on this time path uh, between now and 2050, uh, because our goal is one and a half degrees, as you know. So that's the first thing. The second thing the IAEA did is let's take the policies that the countries have announced in order to get to 2.1 degrees and add all those up. And they come to 2.7 degrees with the policies. So there's a gap between the policies and the objectives, and then the objectives collectively are not uh, aggressive enough. So there's two aspects that need to happen. now. With it's, I'm, I'm gonna. I, I am a former central banker, so you expect me to say this. Has to, <laughs> it's like um, there is an element. Janet Yellen and I did an analysis about a year ago uh, and made this point. And I make this point when I meet with policymakers. There is a comparison to monetary policy. If you have credible and predictable institutions, if you have a track record of delivering price stability. Candidly, it's easier to keep doing that um, you, you, because markets anticipate what you're going to do and then you don't have to do as much of it. I know it sounds uh, that was remarkable, but that's basically the situation the central banks have had themselves in and they've had to work hard to get there. Now, it's the same with climate policy. The more some I can look at that gap between that 2.7 and the 2.1 or ultimately the one and a half, and I can look at it two ways. One, I can say governments aren't doing enough. Another, I can look in and say, ah, that means carbon prices are going to go up even more. That means mm. um, restrictions on, um, um, on heavy emitting industries are going to tighten. And it means there's going to be more support for uh, greener uh, technologies uh, because there's always another budget. There's always new climate plans that are coming in. So that uh, space is filled in. And the market what the market is fantastic about is looking forward. Um, and the more it anticipates that, the more it's going to put money into uh, into those solutions that will benefit and, and keep it away. And that dynamic, that's what's starting now. And, and we're seeing some of the power of that in terms of valuations and risk management. Um, and the imperative is that governments keep going um, and they keep building this track record, having these policies being put in place. Um, and, uh, and that's what will give us the shot. So therefore, last point, um, that's why uh, one of the many reasons why Glasgow uh, meeting is so important. Uh, you say that governments need to keep going, but will they? Because the thing is, net zero costs a lot of money. I mean, if you take a look at China, China needs an estimated $21 trillion to decarbonize. I mean, the risk of them falling back backtracking is real because everybody is grappling with a recovery from the pandemic. Yeah, well, the first thing is that actually 
in terms of the recovery of the pandemic and a sustainable recovery from the pandemic, this is actually part of the solution. Um, uh, the experience with um, green infrastructure, so think of building out renewables as one example or building out the new transportation networks, inter, inter ties and others that are necessary for um, low emission, zero emission vehicles. The job multipliers from those are much higher than the job multipliers from traditional infrastructure, think bridges and roads. Um, so actually, this is the type of activity we really want um, in order to turn the easy bit of this recovery, which was just reopening our economies um, into a sustained investment driven expansion. Um, and, and there are many other examples of that. And of course, most of this is going to be driven not by public spending, but by private spending that is confidence that you know, the type of dynamics that I was just talking about is going to continue. So that's... that's but Mark, are you uh, saying that yeah. in emerging economies where risks are higher? Well, risks, I mean, risks are higher in emerging economies. And uh, first thing, risks are higher in emerging economies. Secondly, I mean, I'm speaking generally, but you, you can make the distinctions. Um, and fiscal space is lower in emerging economies. Um, and the possibility, particularly as global rates move up, um, as, as they will if the expansion continues, um, uh, the um, fiscal risk premia and others and the cost of government borrowing is going to be higher. So it becomes more imperative that the type of framework is put in place, the type of clarity about there's going to be a climate transition is put in place so that that, let's go back to that 88 trillion and counting of capital, so that that flows to these types of projects and, and balances out the restrictions um, on countries. If, if I can make one other point, though, just in terms of your important question about the transition and risk around the transition, it's clearly there are winners and losers in the transition. Um, and there's a reallocation from older economy, high emitting, less competitive industries to greener, uh, more competitive industries. Um, and that means people. That means people who have jobs in those old industries, um, you know, need to find new skill, develop new skills and find new jobs. If you do it overnight, it's exceptionally painful, very difficult and politically exceptionally challenging. So it, it puts an imperative on being clearer about the time frame for the transition. When do you, how you sunset those old industries and, and, and moving people um, into new roles as, uh, you know, in an orderly way. Uh, and that's absolutely uh, imperative. We talk about how governments are committing to climate, but when we take it, the 90 plus sovereign wealth funds around the world are overseeing about what, yeah. $10 trillion in assets, they are lagging behind. What needs to be done to get them on board yeah. and, and, and why that hesitance? Well, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, it's, I, I would agree with your characterization in general that some wealth funds are not leading, um, not leading the transition. Um, there are exceptions um, and there has been some good work. For example, I would note that um, uh, President Macron uh, chairs uh, what we call this One Planet. Uh, one, it's a broader thing, but part of the One Planet initiative includes sovereign wealth funds, and and they came in behind uh, the type of climate disclosure that I was talking about earlier. They, they they made an important declaration on that in about six months ago, which helped push us over the top. So they are moving in those regards, but they're not in general leading on net zero. Um, and I would say uh, a couple of things. One, it partly reflects. Um, the jurisdictions uh, many of them are in, uh, they're in countries that candidly have not yet themselves committed uh, to net zero or to clear net zero pathways. Now that needs to change, um, but it's um, those are sovereign, uh, they're, they're sovereign decisions and they're sovereign wealth funds. So they can help with the architecture of the system, uh, but they haven't yet moved their capital. I will say one other thing though, that we are seeing big moves. We've um, for example, even uh, in the past few weeks, um, uh, the political decisions in uh, Norway uh, with the world's largest sovereign wealth, which affect the world's largest sovereign wealth fund uh, and more explicit um, climate uh, transition uh, mandates uh, in effect to them. So I expect that this will come in, um, but they're just not in general, as per your question, they're not at the vanguard. Are you having conversations? Yes. Oh, yes. No, we have. We, absolutely. We have outreach um, to um, all the major pools of capital, um, understanding 
their issues, um, making sure that they understand where the system is going. Because after all, what are their um, issues, Mark? I mean, give us a sense of what. The well, thing I think is. I think I think part of it is um, well. Let me let me put it in the positive. It is much easier. It's much more straightforward if you are a financial institution in one of those countries that cover the 75% of global emissions where your country is committed to net zero. It, then the question becomes for uh, the board, the, uh, the risk managers, okay, why am, why am I not taking that into account, that transition into account explicitly in how I manage my assets as well? And this is the point I think we're increasingly making to sovereign wealth funds. By the way, if the world's financial system, if the world's moving on the trajectory to net zero, you, you're going to want to understand that and manage to it, or else your your risk reward um, is uh, is is going to skew. Uh, you're you're taking much more risk uh, than you think, much more transition risk than you previously understood, because the world's moving. Look, we're the world needs 100 to 150 trillion, um, half of which, as you know, will be uh, spent in Asia over the course of the next three decades uh, for this transition. We're shooting to have 100 trillion in balance sheet uh, by Glasgow. We're getting into the orders of magnitude of funding this. Now, if you sit on the sidelines of this, you are still going to be affected by this because it's going to affect valuations quite substantially and not just in the extremes of um, heavy uh, fossil fuel industries or fossil fuels versus renewables, but across the whole of the financial sector. So we, we want to have that engagement and, um, you know, we're working on it, Haslinda, and, and I think they are as well. And as I say that I, I'm, there's, in my experience, and it's unfortunately, it's now becoming quite long um, uh, over time, I'm getting older, um, sovereign wealth funds in general have not been at the forefront of innovation in finance. That's, that's candidly uh, what, what I've experienced. It doesn't mean that they don't come in and it certainly, they certainly are important uh, players. Uh, you touched on uh, carbon offsets earlier, carbon offset market, companies around the world buying offsets from groups doing good, like plotting trees, installing clean energy, uh, one offset equivalent to one ton of carbon removed. How crucial is this to us achieving or getting to the goals of the Paris Agreement? Yeah. Well, I think it's very important. Uh, first, you know, first thing to say is there's no simple answer to getting there. If it were uh, to get into the goals of the Paris Agreement, if there were a simple answer, we would do it. Um, so we need a variety of factors. Um, but if we look at over the course of this decade uh, to stay on the trajectory for uh, one and a half degrees, we need to reduce uh, our, our emissions by about 23 uh, gigatons, uh, annual emissions by about 23 gigatons. And there's there's various estimates of how we're going to do that. Obviously, ramping up renewables is a huge element, but it can't do it all. Um, and most estimates um, are somewhere between 8, 10, 15% of that amount uh, will need to come from carbon offsets. Goldman Sachs is at the high end of the range. The actual people, the 400 organizations that were doing the work on the market is towards the lower end, the eight to 10%. So, you know, two gigatons, let's say two to two and a half gigatons removed uh, by the end of the decade on an annual basis, on a flow basis. That's pretty significant. Uh, it's not everything. I mean, again, to be clear, the core responsibility of companies is to reduce their absolute emissions. But while they're doing it, um, having offsets playing a role will be important to keep us on track. You know, you, you referenced earlier in our conversation that, you know, it's code red for humanity, uh, time short, why we left it so late. Well, one of the consequences of that is we need uh, a credible offset market. And, you know, to, to, for those who aren't as, as close to it, let me just make a couple of quick points. One is this market for all the headlines is only about a billion dollars a year. I mean, it is small. Um, and it's fragmented, it's um, inconsistent. And that's why there's been this enormous effort to professionalize it. Um, and a professional market um, that is now in prospect, anchored in Singapore, London, uh, but real truly global. Um, you know, this is a hundred to $150 billion a year market if, uh, if we get it right. And the only way it becomes that big is if it's high integrity. So the offsets have to be real. You need proper you know, qualification monitoring. And those who purchase the offsets have to themselves also be part of the solution. They're not, they can't be buying indulgences, if you will. They have to be reducing their absolute emissions as well. And offsets are a, are a complement to that.
It's not without criticism, though, right? I'm sure you've heard of this, how, you know, you know, it opens a way for companies to buy their way to net zero. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's um, well, the first thing, I mean, the criticisms come into play. A lot of it's historic in terms of the existing market, that there's greenwashing, that, um, you know, some of the projects uh, don't do what they say. They're not permanent uh, removals, etc. And that, yes, to all of the above. And that's why uh, that's why it's being totally uh, rebuilt um, and uh and, and why there's a prospect of having this big market. I think the second element, which is critical, is what you just said is, well, are companies going to use this as an excuse for inaction? Are they going to buy their way out of the problem? Um, and the short answer is no, um, because we can address that by um, who is allowed to purchase the offsets. I mean, the, the, the supply side integrity is the you know, are the trees really planted? Are they still there? Has the renewable uh, factory been put in place, etc.? cetera? Um, but then there's demand side integrity. Who can participate in these uh, markets? Um, look, we have part of the reason why this market uh, is set to take off is there's 3,000 major global companies who've committed to the most rigorous form of net zero, uh, which are science-based targets. That number is growing leaps and bounds very soon i think that will become the norm within a couple of years but those companies and the rigor around that um they're the ones who will be able to participate uh in the market and so it's it's through that demand side integrity that uh, we ensure that it's that 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 it does what it's supposed to and you're confident that a governance body can really provide that enforcement i mean we have so many you know governance body lacking bite well, um, the first, we're very pleased with um, the governance body, which just set up uh, and announced in the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's a great mix geographically uh, of market participants, of major uh, NGOs from, you know, Conservation International, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, WB, uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, uh, part of this indigenous uh, representation on that as well. So there's a good spread of expertise and geographically uh, very senior, very knowledgeable uh, people. And, you know, I'll single out uh, uh, Ma Jun, uh, the former chief economist of the People's Bank of China, one of the leading figures in global sustainable finance, uh, is, uh, is China's representative on that governance body. Now, what we have, and they will are be, that body is critical to defining who can buy offsets and what's a good offset and setting up the verification and monitoring mechanism because it's not just about the project when it's launched and purchased or the offsets purchased but how it performs over time um, and in that regard um, we we have expert uh, groups that support that and we will have um, new forms of monitoring that are set up including using satellite technology and others There's actually i mean we could not do what we intend to do uh, 10 years ago we just wouldn't have had the technology for it last point this needs to be anchored uh, as all good over-the-counter markets need to be anchored in our prudential um, uh, and conduct regulations. So um, to have the conduct authorities uh, overseeing it uh, as you do in other core derivative markets. And we're going to do that from the start. This is not something that will, will happen over time. So I think those protections are, um, are being put in place. The quality of the institutions and the individuals is first rate without question. It's a critical market. Last point is this is a market that will have tremendous scrutiny. Uh, there's a lot of stakeholders uh, involved. There's a lot of focus on it. Um, and you know, one of the ways I, I, I think I'll put it and um, it, just to encapsulate why this market is uh, both poised to take off and, uh, and, uh, and it will be robust. Microsoft is committed to being net negative. So it's going to make up all of its emissions since Bill Gates was in the garage with Paul Allen and Albuquerque. Um, the only way they can do that is through ultimate, through offsets. They can get their own emissions down to zero, but they still have to make up for the past. Sachin Nadella and his team are not going to sign off on accounts unless they really believe the offset they've purchased is real, it's verifiable, and it's going to be monitored going forward. Take that example and multiply it by the many thousands and ultimately tens of thousands of companies. And that's uh, that's a key element of this. Mark, just one final question to wrap it up. COP26, we heard Kerry, John Kerry saying that it will be the last chance the world can avoid climate disaster. What could make or break the Paris Agreement? Well, I think we need 
I'll, 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 because we're short on time, the two things I'll underscore. First, we need countries to really step up uh, to get that number down, that 2.1 down a bit more. So that one and a half degrees is still within sight. It won't be a guarantee of one and a half degrees, but there'll be enough ambition uh, and commitment of countries to keep that one and a half degrees alive, keep 1.5 alive, as they say. Uh, and then secondly, what we've been talking about, finance um, and finance delivering. Um, and it being very clear, and this is why I really appreciate this opportunity um, uh, to have this conversation um, with such an important group, uh, finance is go is there the financial system is being changed um, so that every decision can take climate change into account so for countries in making their policies and for companies in making their uh, investment and, and business decisions strategic decisions they can count on finance uh, if those decisions are driving to net zero that's what we need for glasgow and we have a few weeks to uh, finish finish the job mark carney a pleasure speaking with you thank you so much for your time thank you so much